We are in a series, uh, week two, called Ecclesia. Would you say that with me? Ecclesia. All right, look at you, speaking Greek. Church on Sunday is a good thing. And, and that word, you're actually going to find it 100 times in the New Testament. We interpret it as church. And the most concise and clear and accurate definition of ecclesia or church is this. Called out and called together. Could you say it together? Called out and called together. Let's just be clear that you didn't call yourself out of darkness. You didn't get up one morning like, you know, Wicked Dave on Friday, and I think I'll be Holy Dave on Sunday. And I'm going to get my ducks in a row. No, it was the grace of God. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws him. And while you were running, while you were rebellious, or while you were in dead religion, or just living your own dream, God was gracious enough to pursue you. And David said in in Psalm 40, God drew me up, he called me, he lifted me out of a horrible pit, and he set my feet on a rock, and he established my ways, and he's put a new song in my mouth. In other words, it's all by grace. And then when grace reaches out to you, you extend your faith. You know, that's happening in the room today. There are people in this room at all locations where you're somewhere on the continuum of you're going toward God, but you're still in some bondage. And God comes to you today and says, I will lift you out. My grace is reaching to you. And then you reach out by faith. And when you confess Jesus as Lord, something incredible happens. Redemption occurs, but he's the one who calls us out. Now, when he calls you out, he does not leave you in isolation. He actually brings you into community. He calls you together to something called his church. It's not a denomination. It's not an organization. It's not a building and pastors. It is the living, breathing bride of the Son of God, the King of Majesty, who's coming back for his church. Anybody with me today? All right. Uh, And by the way, it's good to respond to church, right? Come on, preach with me for a few minutes. I I want us all to read together, all locations. 1 Peter 2.9, lift up your voice and read this. Here we go. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So that's the first thing. He calls us out. And then he calls us together. Is this Ephesians verses come on the screen? I want you to read just the bold with me, if you would. Lift it up. Here we go. Together we are his. One more time with passion. Together we are his house. And we're built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together. I feel like we need to do that to, again, together, together. You read the bold. And in him, you two are being built together. We're becoming something. God's doing something bigger than all of us, and here's what it is. He's building a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Now, this is the definition of the church. God calling us out, calling us together as living stones to build a temple One stone by itself is not a temple. It's the interlocking. It's your gift, grace, capacity, joining with others so that Jesus might be revealed. Now, this has always been God's plan. By the way, the church is God's plan A to redeem this fallen planet. There is no other plan. The church is God's design. He birthed it. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said upon the rock of the revelation of who he is that he would build his ecclesia and the gates of hell, the very forces of hell and demons themselves would not be able to oppose what God's going to do through his church. And I'm telling you, God is building a church. Now, the problem with church is men mess it up. Religion jacks it all up sideways, right? Because we get in, we got our rules and our regulations and how we think it should be done, and we deviate from the original pattern. And so when people think about church, what do they think about? Long, boring services. Yawn, when can we go to lunch? Or mean pastors, or all they want is your money, and all the the rules and regulations. Never God's design. God's design that there would be people who've been brought out of darkness. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They're passionately in love with Jesus. And when we come together, the Holy Spirit is in the midst of his people in such a way that there's a beauty. There's an attractiveness. And I'm telling you, it is happening to a measure at the Father's house. But there's more to come. You know, the enemy has no authority, no hold on Jesus. You knew that. 
Jesus hangs on a cross. They put him in a tomb for three days. He resurrects, and the enemy cannot touch the groom. But during this dispensation, this time era between the resurrection and the imminent second coming of Christ, there is a very real enemy that has access not to the groom, but to the bride. And if we don't worship and wear our armor and pray and get united in community, you've all felt this. You felt the attack of a very real enemy. And so what the enemy does during this time that we live, he's trying to divide and deconstruct the bride of Christ. I just read an alarming stat that of all the Christians in America that say, I'm a Christ follower, I'm a believer, less than 20% attend church regularly. What is that? It's culture. It's the voice that says, well, you can serve God, but I, you don't need church. I talk to people. They're like, yeah, I'm a spiritual person. Yeah, I'm, I am, and I, I know Jesus, and I believe the Bible, but I don't like church. I don't like church people. That's not my thing. Anytime you hear that lie, believe that lie, or speak that lie, let me tell you the origin. That is demonic in its origin. That opposes everything your Bible teaches and what Jesus came to build. Let me give you a news update. The church is not going anywhere. It's not diminishing. It's not shrinking. God is building his church, and he's coming back for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. That's what Jesus Jesus is returning for. How many glad you're a part of it today? Make some noise out there at Roseville. Come on, Napa, make some noise. This is what Jesus is building, and we're called out, and we're called together. And I want to encourage you to build your life on something that can't be opposed or something that's unstoppable. I think we want to live that kind of life, don't we? We want to live a life of legacy. We want to live a life of victory. And here's the way it happens. It's Psalm uh, 127.1. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Now, the house is your life. Remember, Jesus was talking about building houses. He's talking about two guys. He said, one guy built this house, and the other guy built a house right next to him, and they looked apparently the same except for the foundation. One built on sand, one built on the rock. And the sand represents culture, society, all the culture's grappling for, and that is status and more and more for me and my bank accounts and my retirements and third homes or whatever. And God wants to bless you. That's not the point. But here's the point. If you build on sand, if you build for temporary, there is a coming day of reckoning. There is a storm that's headed that way. And Jesus said, when the storm hits or at the end of the age, the house that's built upon the rock. So in order to live an unstoppable life, here would be my recommendation. Build your life into what and upon what Jesus gave his life for. And that is the church. And it makes sense because now it's like my, my goals, my ambitions, they get, the biblical word, sanctified. They get set apart for God's purpose. Now there's a reason for your business to prosper. Now there's a reason for your talent and your gifting. It's, it's bigger than ourselves and, you know, our egos and our reputations. We actually live lives that make a difference in the lives and the eternities of other people. Are you guys hearing this today? And you are building something with your life. We all are. Hopefully you're not building a, a legacy of debt and pain and abuse, but you're building a legacy that says, when I think about putting your name, fill in the blank, and whenever you leave this planet, when people consider you, they'll think, that person, they led me to Jesus. They taught me about the word of God. They made a difference in my life. So a couple questions. What are you building with your life? That's, that's just a good thing to think about for a moment. What am I building? And then who's providing the plans? You know, whenever God was going to build a tabernacle, a temple, whatever God built, Old and New Testament, he always provided plans. So if you're going to build something for the future with accuracy, something that's going to endure, God has given you a Bible full of blueprints to build your life well. Amen? So here at the Father's house, as for me and Donna, for our leadership team, as for our house, we're taking this serious. It's not just theological or ethereal, but we're building people. We're building the house of God. And the next house we're going to build is the Father's house, Oakland. You guys up for it? We're pretty excited about what God's going to do in Oakland. I think Pastor Jules and Lonnie, where you at? Give us a wave over here. There they are right there. Give it up. And uh, just about a one-minute clip. This is a bit of their heart for Oakland. Check this out. We've been pastors for a number of years, and we just couldn't shake this dream in our heart. And we feel like there is no better place in all of America, let alone the world, than Oakland, California. We 
We are Jules and Lonnie Moore, and we are pastors of TFH Oakland. We feel like family has been a word that has been overlooked, has been marginalized, but we feel like family is the key for this church. But one of the things that Oakland has been known for as being a city that's fatherless, and we feel like it's just the heart of God to build a father's house. It says in Psalms 145, it says that God will lift up those that have fallen short. God will give food to those in need. And we believe that's where we're called to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. We're called to represent Jesus in the Bay Area. Come on, give the Lord a praise. And we want to invite you at whatever level the Holy Spirit would lead you to be a part of that. And we're going to have an interest meeting on the 23rd. Bring up this slide. And uh, for those of you who want to be over in Building C, some of us, uh, you're, you're just going to pray for Oakland and God will give you a burden. You'll help us pray. Others are going to give. We're going to give generously, invest financially into what God's going to do there. But some of you might want to be a part of the scaffolding and a six-month commitment to help the church get started and set the culture and the DNA and worship and serve. And then there'll be a few. God will speak to you to, to uproot your life and get it planted in Oakland. We've seen that in San Francisco and Orange County and now where God has taken the Father's house to plant churches. But be open to what the Holy Spirit would do. Amen? So here's the question I want to ask today. What does the church look like that God is building? What is it supposed to look like? You know, with all the versions of religion and church experiences and cults and all the misinterpretations of church, isn't there something in the word that's a clear portrait of what God is doing? Sure enough, in the book of Acts, uh, the church, Jesus had ascended about 15 years later. The church is only 15 to 17 years old, so younger than the Father's house, and the Holy Spirit's being poured out. People are getting saved now in different nations and miracles are taking place and apostles are being scattered throughout the known world and Christians are being persecuted for their faith. And there was this big argument. And here's what the argument was. What should the church look like? Who do we let in? Who do we keep out? What are the standards? What are the rules? How good do you have to be to be a part of the community? And how messed up do you have to be to get kicked out? And religion has always argued those points. What are the qualifications to be a part of what God is doing? And there's this unique, amazing, I mean, just this stunning portion of Scripture I want to read to you today where God reveals what he wants the church to look like. And we're going to look at Acts uh, chapter 15. Let me read the word to you. Acts 15. While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers... Unless you're circumcised, as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. There's a membership class for you. Who wants to sign up? All right, moving on. Okay. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing, how do you say that word? Vehemently. But what it means in the original language, it's, it's an in-your-face heated discussion. In other words, they say, hey, we're going to talk this out. We're going to settle it right now. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem. They stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them, much to everyone's joy, uh, that the Gentiles, time out if you're new to the team, when you see Gentiles in the scripture, here's what it means. People far from God. The Gentiles represent those that were not a part of Judaism. They didn't know Yahweh. They didn't know about Jehovah. They didn't know the rules. They didn't know the Torah, the Old Testament. They were just lost people out there doing their thing. And God says, I'm doing something new. I'm drawing them from every tribe and every nation, people far from God. So the Gentiles, too, were being converted. They arrived in Jerusalem. Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them. But then some of the believers who belonged to who? The sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted, as they do to this day. The Gentile conference must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. So the apostles and elders met together to resolve this issue. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you uh, some time ago to preach to the Gentiles that they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts, and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He made, look, he made no distinction between us and them. That was a big hurdle for the religious community. No distinction. He cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear. Time out. 
That's what religion does. It puts a yoke and rules and regulations on people that God never intended. Verse 11, we believe that we're saved the same way, come on somebody, by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. So this argument turns into this Holy Ghost moment right now. We're shifting gears. And everybody's listening quietly. Barnabas and Paul are telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God did through them among the Gentiles. When they had finished, James stood up and said, now James is a companion of Jesus, the younger brother of Jesus. He's the senior apostle in the room, the senior statesman. He's the old dude, all right? So James stands up after the argument, after this moment. He says, brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. And this conversion of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted, as it is written. Now, time out. He quotes a prophecy from 850 years previously, a minor prophet named Amos. So in the middle of this discussion about circumcising Gentiles, who gets in, who gets out, heated argument, the senior apostle says, wait a minute. There's a prophecy from 850 years ago, and right now it's being fulfilled. Verse 16, he said, and afterward I will return. The afterward is after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. After the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, which was the birth of the New Testament church that you're a part of, here's what God said he would do. I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins. I will restore it so that the rest of humanity may seek the Lord, including the Gentiles. All those I've called to be mine, the Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. And so my judgment is, read the bold with me, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Read the bold one more time. We should not make it difficult. Now, as I was studying this and preparing to talk to you guys, I want to talk to you about building a life that lasts. And I thought, well, there's a, that might be a good title. I was going to go with Built to Last. And then I realized, I think that's a Chevy truck commercial. So we tossed that one out. And we're going to go with Don't Make It Difficult. Would you say that with me? Religion makes it difficult to get to God. Organizations make it difficult to get to God. Standards and rules not set by the Holy Spirit are stumbling blocks that people can't get over to find Jesus. Now, the interesting thing about this portion of scripture I just read is this, that the original template was the tabernacle of Moses, right? Outer courts, inner courts, brazen labor to wash up. You offer the sacrifice. The high priest goes into the holy place. There's the menorah where you worship God and the priest minister to God and the people. It's all about walls and courtyards and dividers. God didn't say he's reestablishing the tabernacle of Moses or Solomon's temple, which was functioning for 400 years successfully with the ark of God right in the holy of holies. And God didn't say he was going to reconstruct what was now Herod's temple on Mount Moriah in downtown Jerusalem. Do you realize that while they're having this argument, the temple was under a 50-year rebuild, remodel construction program. It was being done all through Jesus' life. And they finished it in A.D. 64, only to have it destroyed by Rome just six years later in A.D. 70. Now, God didn't say, I'm restoring Herod's temple, Zerubbabel's work, Nehemiah's wall, Tabernacle of Moses. He said, no, I'm going to go back in time and I'm going to restore David's tabernacle or David's tent. Why? Because the Tabernacle of David was a prophetic look at the church. All of a sudden in history, God allows David to take the very Ark of the Covenant and set it up in a tent on Mount Zion with no partitions, no veil, no walls, no restrictions. And God said, this is a look at what I'm going to do in the last days. I'm going to put my presence right down in the middle of my people so that all nations can come and behold my beauty. That's what he's building, church. He's building a house for his glory. Now, Let me refresh your memory. This is review for most, but here's a look at Solomon's temple, and you'll see that the outer court was the court of the Gentiles. They weren't allowed in. There was actually a dual wall. There had been a wall and a gap, and there was signage that said, if you pass beyond this point, you will do it at the cost of your own life. And then the women could get to the furthest court out, but they couldn't go past another wall, a separation. Then there was the court of the priests, but only a select few that were chosen by lot could go to the holy place to minister to the Lord. And between the holy place and the most holy place was the veil. 
And the veil was a 45 foot tall curtain, several inches thick of woven material that separated the priest from the very presence of God in the Holy of Holies. And this is the the template. This was the model that lasted for thousands of years. And God says, I'm getting ready to change everything. I've got a new plan because it was all pointing to Jesus. You see, Jesus is our high priest that takes us right in behind the veil. Says that when he went to heaven, he's become an anchor for our soul. And he's gone in within the veil. Jesus, as we sit here, he is with the Father in the Holy of Holies. And he has sent the Holy Spirit to indwell you and to lead you right into the very presence of God. But these Old Testament Jews, man, these Pharisees, they were like, not on our watch. We're not tearing down these walls. They're here for a reason, and we're going to make sure they stand. But Jesus comes along, and when he stretches out his arms on the cross, and the seven sayings from the cross, the final one, Jesus says, it is finished. And when he says, it is finished, the 45-foot veil in the temple was ripped by the hands of God from top to bottom, and the wall begins to crumble. And God was saying, okay, now it's time for everybody to come in. Listen, what God tears down, religion rebuilds under the name of God and under the name of an organization. And I want you to know at the Father's house, by the grace of God, we're not here to build a religion, a denomination. We're not here to build a monument to men's honor. We are here here to build the house of the living God and the tabernacle of David and a place for God's presence to abide. I'm going to preach for about 10 minutes, so buckle up. Ephesians 2.14 says, Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people in his own body on the cross. He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. You know when certain people feel like they got the inside track and we're religious and you're not and we know God and you don't, it creates hostility in those left outside the walls. He did this by ending the system of law. That's a key phrase. He ended it. With its commandments and regulations, he made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. So why am I sharing this with you today? The reason I'm sharing this is you are a co-laborer with Christ. Lean in here. Anytime God was going to build something, he told Moses, I'm going to build a meeting place and my presence is going to come. I'm going to meet you face to face. And then he said, oh, by the way, here's the blueprints. Make sure you build it according to the pattern. God, I thought you were going to build it. I am, and you're my construction crew. (laughs) Then Jesus says in Matthew, I will build my church. And then shortly after that, he looks at his disciples and says, now go into all the world and make disciples. Go build my church. What I'm saying, guys, is God is building something in our land. He's building something in California. He's building something in our city. And you are his construction crew. So if we know the mandate, if we've read the plans, we can go ahead and get busy and we can build what God is building and we can tear down what the cross has already torn down in Jesus' name. Amen? So the first barrier was an ethnic and a racial barrier. This was the wall of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles, they could only pray from afar. They couldn't even get to where the court of the women or the commoners, they couldn't get near the priest because of their ethnicity. So ethnic is basically religions, cultures, and minorities. And then race is this. You have a different color skin than I do. You speak a different language. You're not from around here, are you? So we distance people. Fallen humanity has always distanced people from their God because of race and gender and belief system and ideology and geographical location. And I find this in in Americans. I've had conversations with people. I'm like, You would think that Jesus was American. Like America is the bastion of Christianity, the birthplace of Christianity, right? Like America is God's nation and the rest can just figure it out on their own. How arrogant. As if he was, you know, Jesus was born in Nashville, you know? (laughs) Little blonde haired, blue eyed Jesus come out to the West Coast riding his surfboard. He's an American Jesus. No, he's from the Middle East, (laughs) right? Okay, that was a rant. Not on the notes. Anyway, moving on. So God breaks down that middle wall of partition. And here's why I have to say this to you, because racism is inherent in the fallen hearts of humanity. Now, some of you struggle more with it because your parents or your granddad or you're raised in the South or whatever you did. 
and, and, but you're, you're working it out, and that's great. You're growing more like Jesus. Some of you, you got a pretty clean heart, but I'll tell you this. All of us have the propensity and the traces of racism tucked in our hearts because it's part of a fallen planet. It started at the Tower of Babel, and it's continued in every generation. So what we have to do, we have to come and say, Jesus, if there's any of that in my heart, I'm asking you to forgive me. We repent of it. I'll just say, as for this house, the Father's house, we are about every tribe and nation and skin color and ethnicity and whoever our Lord shall call. We're going to nations. We're planting churches in different nations. We love Cambodia and Nicaragua and Vietnam. We got teams going to Haiti. We got teams going to Poland. God is all about the nations. Are you with me? The second wall, I'm gonna preach at you ladies for a minute is the gender divide. So the women had to stay at a distance in the women's court. They were still limited because of their gender. And Jesus comes to earth. I don't know if you knew this, but when Jesus came to the earth, he became the great liberator of all women. He elevated women, he honors the roles of women, and he gives them authority. Jesus comes and he begins to break down the gender walls, amen? Galatians 3.27 says this, all who've been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. Read the bold with me. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm obviously not talking about blurring gender lines in regards to sexuality and transgender and all that's happening in our culture. That's a different sermon. What I am talking about today is the walls of access to God and the walls of ministry authority. Jesus broke down those barriers. Do you know that women preached and prophesied and led the church? There were churches in the homes of women in the New Testament. And I'm not here to pick a theological fight because I know someone's going to bristle up on this. But if you come from Reformed theology, we're taught that no, women cannot be a pastor in the church. Women cannot preach and teach. The women can only go over, and we got some kids over there that will let you minister to the babies. And we have a lovely kitchen we've just remodeled, and you go back and cook the men folks some grub, okay? So religion creates gender walls. And I want to tell you at the Father's house, by the way, if you want to do some research, if you go to tfh.org under the visitor tab, there's a thorough theological paper put together by a group of smart people here at the church, very thorough, about why we release women into ministry. Because God is not recognizing gender when it comes to accessing his presence or moving in authority. He's looking at heart and character, and you're a part of a church where women can preach and teach and lead and be pastors and change the world for the glory of God. Come on, somebody. And all the women said, "Woo! oh, that's right. Preach that stuff. Now, the next wall, because I'm running out of time, was a dividing wall between the commoners and the priests those that were actually qualified to minister. And the men of Israel could come close, but there was an established religious hierarchy that the Pharisees were unwilling to let go of. And Jesus comes, he says, you know what? I'm knocking down this wall that divides those that think they're qualified or have been qualified from the common folk so that all of my people can enter right in to the Holy of Holies. Do you know in the book of Revelation what he calls you, right? You are kings and priests unto our God. Look at this in 1 Peter 2. And you are living stones that God is building into a spiritual temple. You are his holy priest. Could you read that out loud with me? You are. If you're sitting by somebody, you know, just look at them and go, you're a holy priest, dude. You're a holy priest. Holy priest, Batman. That's who you are. You're a holy priest. Now to all my, you know, Reformed Catholics, recovering Catholics, visiting Catholics, I love you, and you can get to heaven from the Catholic Church, so don't be tripping, okay? It's all good. But here's the deal. We've been taught that the pontifus, the priest, the man of God, the one who hears from God, he goes into the Holy of Holies, then he comes out and presents the word to the commoners, and there's a separation between priest and the followers, never God's design. But there's something in the heart of fallen humanity that says, no, we want our priests and our pastors to be elevated in such a way that, and here's what it looks like when you build this wall. Well, only the pastor can baptize people, right? 
And the, only, the pastor really hears from God. I, I got to get close to him because he'll hear from God. And, and only the pastor can really preach and teach the word. I mean, I don't know if I'm even qualified to do that. And we begin to elevate humanity. And there's something about the pride of man and religious pride that goes, yes, I'm the man of God. And I've come to share with you the truth of the word. So I want to thank all of you commoners for assembling today. As I throw out the meat of the word to the plebeians in the third row. Here, yeah. be fed, be filled. Run along now. And I will go back to my ivory tower and study the sacred scriptures. Come again next week. Don't forget to tithe. Dave out. Right? Right? And there's some like, yeah, I, I kind of like that. You know, I'm God's man. You know, read my business card. Great big furry deal in the kingdom, Pastor Dave. Never God's design. You know, I was, I was born into a church in Long Beach, California. In fact, I was born practically at church <laughs> over here, but my mom went into labor during Sunday morning service, got up and rushed out during the preaching, and I was back next Sunday. I'm just bragging, saying I've never missed a week. <laughs> Gold star. My attendance record far better than you, but don't be intimidated. But in this church I was birthed into, it was very religious, very uh, legalistic, and the pastors were so revered. Now listen, side note, honor where honor is due, of course. We honor the king, we honor the president, we honor people in authority. You should honor pastors, there's no doubt. But here's what it looked like. These guys would wait, the room at Colonial Tabernacle, Long Beach, California, packed. And right as service would start, the, these pastors would come out of a, a back room. And I remember them walking out, and as they came out, they walk out, whew, and we had these large, anybody ever been to a church with large chairs, miniature thrones for the pastors? Okay, not enough of you, but it's scary. And they had these large, I remember them being velvet chairs, right? And they would go out, and all of us out there, oh, here they come, the pastors, the men of God. And they would do a complimentary kneel. They'd kneel down in front of their chair, a little three-point stance. We are like, oh. They're praying right now. Right now, they're meeting with God. It was about this 15. And then they would get up, and they would somberly sit in their chairs. And as a little boy, I'm thinking, that's jacked up. And it is. Because they would watch us worship, and we were in awe and reverence of them instead of the Son of God, who's the center of his church. I'm telling you. If you are disillusioned, thinking, my prayers are more powerful than yours, you need to knock that down. If you don't think you can pray for the sick and see them recover, or you can baptize people in water or preach the word in your living room, you are a king and a priest unto God. Kick down that religious wall. Go right into the Holy of Holies. Let's be the church. Let's be the church. I'm going to have the band come, not because I'm done preaching, just because I'm out of time and I want to honor yours, kind of. So what is God building? What is God building? Tabernacle of David. Here, here's the deal. Bring up this image. Right here in the, in the middle of history, God brings up a tent, and the side panels were removable. Now, this tent was massive, because in this tent, there was nothing but the Ark of the Covenant, the very Shekinah, the evident, visible glory of God. And 24-7, there were worshipers. There were priests. There were psalmists. There was, oh, there you guys are. Look at you. Let's, can we do that together? Everybody. Okay, next week, that's our worship flow right there. You got it? East Bay, you got it? Keep doing it. It's good. Till the glory of God comes. Okay. 288 singers, over 100 musicians, and the psalmist would climb up Mount Zion, come down the Mount of Olives, up past the Kidron Valley, and they would stop at different elevations, and they would sing psalms of ascent. And when they got to the top of the mountain, there was the very presence of God. This prophetic look at what God's church is to be. And God's church is exactly that. No walls, no denominational garbage, no arguments about feminism and male chauvinism and racism and all the isms. He says, no, no, I just want my people to come inside the covering of my presence and behold my beauty. This is what I'm building in the earth. It's the church of the living God. So before we close, have you committed your life to building what Jesus is building? What man-made walls do you need to tear down? And the last question, have you responded to his invitation to walk right into God? Because the final wall, the final access was this. It was access to God himself. When Jesus said, it is finished, 
He opened up a way. Listen, some of you are here today and watching and you feel unqualified. You feel ashamed. You feel like you can't get to God because of what you've done. And if you believe that lie, you will always stay at a distance. But it's never about what you've done or haven't done. It's not about your spiritual successes or your failures. It's always been about the moment on the cross that ripped the veil. And God says, I'm giving access now because you're all my priests. I wanna see you face to face. You know, we use the word presence and in the Old Testament Hebrew it is paneum and it means face to face. It means that God turns his countenance and his face and his favor right toward you and he looks in your face. And he says, I love you, I accept you. And as I was praying for you guys, getting ready for this weekend, I believe this is what God wants to do. He wants to look right in your face and say, you know all that stuff you messed up on, all that shame, just bring it to me. Bring it to the cross. I'll forgive you, I will cleanse you. Now, the last verse is this right here. So let us go right into the very presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. That's the invitation today. Let us go right in to the very presence of God. Nothing holding us back. This is God's invitation. How many of you guys want to be a part of what God's building? How many of you love the church? How many of you say we build the tabernacle of David, not of Moses? Come on, let's build something for His glory. 